All right, well, we can't say this past weekend was boring in motorsports, that's for sure. Uh, I know there are going to be some fans who were a little bit uh, disappointed about how the race uh, went down uh, in Nashville. But then there will be other uh, fans, like yours truly, who actually loved uh, every minute of the craziness, the wackiness, uh, of uh, what almost 330 laps for a 300 lap race cj was that how pretty much how it went basically i forget how many it was five extra overtime restarts so however many extra laps that added up to yeah it was wild i didn't think it was gonna it was the race that was never gonna end yeah 331 so and look uh it's just all because of i mean for, for me and it's always been the case as a NASCAR fan. It's what got me hooked on NASCAR, was gambling on, on NASCAR. And that's the reason why I had a good time with it. Because, now look, would I would I have had a good time with it if Zane Smith had won? No. Uh, but even though it would have been, you know, nice for him. But anyway, uh, in all, you know, Logano was part of what I talked about on Saturday. I, I said, I'm taking all the Fords, going with all the long shots. And it paid off for me with Logano. Uh, so, and, and I just thought that, you know, when you see the same drivers, uh, CJ, you know, the Denny Hamlins and the Larsons and the so forth, it, it, I'm okay with seeing some long shots race for the lead at the end. And again, it wasn't like it was the most exciting race. It was okay. But, you know, the drama at the end, maybe if it had only gone two cautions, it would have been a really much better result. Obviously, it got out of hand with five, but then I also started thinking, you know, we always talk about what could you do to make NASCAR a little bit more exciting on some of these tracks, and, well, the only thing you could do is manipulate the tires. Well, now I'm thinking, well, maybe you can manipulate the gas, because uh, that can make uh, racing in NASCAR in some uh, circumstances pretty fun, too, as uh, some of these drivers just uh, have no idea if they're running out of gas or not. <laughs> It was definitely interesting. Uh, I think you're being generous about saying that the race was all right up until that point. It was very clear that it was going to be, you know, Christopher Bell or, or Denny Hamlin. Christopher True. Bell ended up losing it. So then it was basically Hamlin or maybe Reddick. Uh, and Hamlin was in position to win. I mean, Joey Logano was in 14th place when the final caution came out and he ended up winning the race. I mean, that was two laps from the scheduled within two laps from the scheduled distance less than three miles away from the finish logano was 14th <laughs> but i mean all all the credit in the world for them being able to pack that full uh the design of the engine and their ability to stretch it as long as they did they stretched it further than absolutely anybody else and they still had enough to come around and do a, a quarter of a burnout uh, before he ran out of fuel so yeah. uh yeah i think it i it definitely made it more exciting um, almost wanted to fast forward until that end. Um, <laughs> but, well, that's yeah, the thing. The yeah. yeah, I can understand if you're at the racetrack and you got to wait over and over. And I, and I get that. See, that's the thing. I don't really watch live sporting events. Even, uh, I mean, it's very rare. Sometimes I'll, go, I'll catch up late in an event because I know it's ending. Um, so maybe if I had caught up, but every time I was kind of getting caught up, I just decided I'm going to stop it I, I, and I'm going to do something else. I got, I'm going to do another work, you know, I'm doing this, that, and the other thing. Then I go back. So I can understand if you're out the track, it could be a real pain. I, I totally get the, the difference. Um, but when you're not watching it live and you can just fast forward through all that waiting, it's a little bit easier to deal with. Yeah, for sure. You do have the concession stand at the track, though, so that's all. That's true, too. Fun. <laughs> yes. You can go souvenir shopping or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was the entire race up until that point seemed like a normal kind of 1.5 mile oval track race to me where it's very predictable. You kind of knew who was going to be strong right from yeah. the beginning. Lo and behold, they were. Christopher Bell won both stages. Uh, Hamlin was second and I think fourth in the second stage, first, second in the first stage, like fourth in the second stage. Uh, Bell, you know, had, had the accident, got himself in a bad situation, lost control, ended up hitting the wall. Uh, that I thought was going to be the extent of the excitement because Hamlin, it was just a matter of time before he chased down 
um, and, and passed ultimately for, for the lead, um, Ross Chastain. Um, and, and Chastain, another one that we thought, you know, regardless of where he qualifies, he's somebody that you've got to take. And lo and behold, everybody who we talked about early in the week was there in the top five, basically, with two laps to go. Yeah, Chastain but was then, pretty much our top pick. He was. Both of and, then, yeah. and then when you had another, whatever, um, 20 some laps or, or whatever it was, 31 laps, sorry. Um, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're going to have some fuel issues in these cars. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, that was definitely the most exciting part. Yeah, I guess with the DVR and everything, just fast forwarding to the end was the right way to watch that race. And of course, uh, I, I don't know what was going on with the, with, with the decision. Uh, Ryan Blaney uh, and his team deciding to stay out at that one point in time. I don't know what they were thinking. I agree. And I mean, I know they probably felt they had to take a chance because they were, I mean, for a while there, it was, you had like the four Toyotas mm -hmm. and Blaney. And he just kind of knew he wasn't yeah. going to have a chance to get past these guys. So you had to do something different. Exactly right. I, I think they were in that situation and they just had to do something different than the cars that they were racing against. And, and so they've got the win. They have the luxury of being able to, to, to take that alternative route. And it paid off for his teammate, Joey Logano. It did. <laughs> <In the end. laughs> and Blaney still ended up in the top 10. He did. Uh, he did. Yeah, he had a good yeah. race. There so, are only two, two drivers, I'm sorry, three drivers that started inside the top 10 and finished inside the top 10. Only one driver started inside the top five and finished in the top 10. He didn't even finish in the top five. And that was Kyle Larson who finished eighth. He started fourth. Wow. Which is just crazy for that track, too. Yeah. So, um, well, let's uh, pick it up here because this is just uh, too wild uh, not to recap. And by the way, we're also going to take a look at the craziness that went down uh, in F1 uh, in Austria uh, a little bit later on. Um, and again, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, posting the F1 video uh, by itself. So if you want to check all that out, uh, check out the F1 video. Okay, so here we are. Let's see. This is when Denny Hamlin uh, finally catches. Let me uh, finally catches Chastain and is able to get past him. And you knew there was just too many laps. Chastain did a really good mm -hmm. job holding him off as long as he could. But it, it just uh, it, you know. And then once you saw this, you were like, "It's it's over. There's just no way." And he pulls away. And then uh, y y you felt that at that moment, the race is over. Nothing's, you know, there's nothing you can do. Um, and and it's just this little incident. And this usually, and this is really where it happens. This is why, you know, when you're, you got your fingers crossed. If you're, if you've got Chastain and other drivers, oh, I need that late caution. If you're Denny Hamlin's you know, team. And that's the thing that's just a killer because I've been down this road many times where you've got Denny Hamlin and he's your pick and he's he's the one that's going to make you money and you're just counting the laps down and there's two to go and you just say, <laughs> one more and I'm good and and then the caution comes. It's a killer. It's an absolute killer. Uh, but you know, that's that's what made the race at least interesting, like you said. Otherwise, it just would have been another race. Yeah, and I, you know, it's funny that in hindsight, the person that brought out the caution was another Penske car. Uh, but that, the but even when it happened, like he, he didn't, he kept going. Like I, I don't, I'm not entirely sure if they jumped on the caution too quickly. Um, it almost felt to me like they did, um, but nonetheless, uh, the crashes and the wildness that happened on those restarts afterward, um, <laughs> those <laughs> those were just amazing to watch through the next 30 some laps. All right, so now we're gonna pick up, so this is really where we had a couple of, the, a couple of the cautions that came out, which were the, you know, the, cause we had some that were, I think a couple of them that weren't all that, important nothing mind, mind shattering but this was the biggest one and this is kyle larson and yep. i've said this before and i know there are other uh fans who feel the same way i do is that to me i think kyle larson 
is oh, he's not exact but he's starting to get really similar to like the way Kyle Busch used to drive but the difference is Kyle Larson's like a oh, little old Kyle Larson he comes out of the car and he's like this tall and he's just this little imp- we talked about it he does remember we talked about the whole idea about does he have the type of personality to be you know this like major uh you know, uh, figurehead for the sport. No. And this is part of the reason because he carries himself like that. I'm just little old Kyle Larson, but he does a lot of the same aggressive driving, uh, that Kyle Busch used to do and others, but I'm just pointing out since Bush is still driving, but yet Kyle, Kyle's this big imposing in your face guy that, Oh, uh, boo. And you know, everybody's on him. But I think fans are starting to get a little bit, ticked off at what Kyle Larson's doing because of the facts. Same thing with Kyle Busch. They're so good and they win so often. It's like, I'm going to get to Max Verstappen in F1. Similar situation. You're so good. Do you really have to do this? Is this really what you have to do? There's other drivers that, like Charles Chastain, doesn't have a win. Now, I know he wasn't trying to wreck Chastain, but this is what happened and this is what caused Chastain. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's it's just, again, like I said, it's just at a point now where I think a lot of fans are also realizing what I've been saying for, for a while now that, you know, Kyle Larson uh, needs to start chilling out a little bit. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, he was definitely aggressive. I don't know how much of the interaction with Denny Hamlin in the race leading up to that point. It was a little bit, yeah aggressive because he was wanting to get to Hamlin because Hamlin was racing him very hard. Uh, So you know he wanted to get up there and he wanted to beat Hamlin. And right at that turn right there, you can see the yellow line that normally divides the apron from the banking on the track. That was worn down. You've got tire marks and the rubber completely over it. And it's also getting dark. You can see the lights on right there at the speedway. It's darker inside the car. I question how much I'm not making any excuses. He was absolutely being aggressive and he was without a doubt giving everything he possibly could to get to Hamlin. But I'm thinking that 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 mistake came from the confluence of those factors. And it was literally just a mistake. Oh yeah, Uh, sure. He he definitely didn't want to take out Chastain. He was going after Hamlin. He had to get by Chastain in order to get to Hamlin. And unfortunately that's just kind of the way it played out. Unfortunately, Ross, I, 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 for for Ross. I, I was very impressed with Ross's interview when he came out of the care center afterward. He was exceptionally calm. Yes, he um, was. And took it very well. We'll he see did. how that plays out over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and it's also like what we've talked about before with today's drivers, how much calmer they are uh, when something happens. And um, I, you know, I I don't know what I don't know what I would want if I'm a Ross Chastain fan. If uh, I got money on Ross Chastain and this happens, do I want him to come out of the car and start kicking ass, all that kind of stuff? But yeah, it's just uh, I, this is just another example. Is this something like this would have happened five, ten years ago? I really think there would have been an altercation. Especially, I mean, mainly, I think, because Ross Chastain, again, needs a win, and he did nothing wrong, and he had a shot to win the race. I, I think he, I think another driver years ago might have taken hands, might, might have taken his own, uh, you know, um, uh, put himself in a position probably he shouldn't, but still, it would have been fun for us to watch, and that would have been the old days. Uh, but, again, you know, these guys are a little bit different. Yeah, definitely different, definitely different sponsor demands, definitely a different environment, I would say, of uh, fans than probably there was 10 years ago. I mean, we've got a lot of cancel culture going on now and a lot of people that can, or recently, and and people that can lose their their livelihoods. You know, Larson fell afoul of that. Several of the other drivers have fallen afoul of that. So definitely treading more lightly in these more controversial areas. But um, you know, Chastain has had his history with Hamlin as well. I wonder if he understood at that point what Larson was trying to do to get back to Hamlin and was maybe a little bit more okay with it. And, had, you know, unfortunately, yeah. you have to be collateral damage. Um, but yeah, I, it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, I was impressed with Chastain's interview afterward. Um, 
I think I think the one that really comes out as the the loser on this, I would say, is Hamlin because there's two drivers right there, uh, and he even raced Truex extremely hard, and that's his teammate. They they touched on one of the restarts, if I remember correctly, as well, um, and I think um, <clears throat> I think uh, he's making a lot of enemies. It's going to be tough for him to navigate the playoffs with that type of. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, dissatisfaction with his driving when we get to the playoffs. Uh, again, this is all about Larson and all about Chastain, but uh, I think Hamlin helped build up that aggression that was under Larson's helmet at that time. Yep, no doubt about it. Uh, matter of fact, I think Denny takes a lot more criticism, uh, and I'm not saying he doesn't deserve it. Uh, but again, I just think that now... Maybe it's time that Kyle Larson starts getting criticized as much because D Denny's earned the criticism. Um, Kyle's earning it too. But yeah, I, I, look, I, I think Ross yeah. did the right thing. I, I don't think he, I mean, look, as a fan, you do, like I said, you want to see something, some passion, but you're right. It what, Larson didn't mean to, um, right. but that didn't stop drivers five, ten years ago. They didn't care. <laughs> You know? Yeah, I think uh, to your point, I do think Larson deserves all the criticism in the world for this. It was obviously a mistake. Um, aggressively trying to get up there. He has multiple wins in the bank. He took out somebody who doesn't have a win there. But, you know, he's also a competitor and I, he's not going to go to bed crying that Ross Chastain at this point no. isn't in the playoffs because he knows he's going to, Ross Chastain, if he is in the playoffs, would be someone he'd have to overcome. Uh, not that Larson can't overcome anyone. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it is a knockout game. You got to peak at the right time, and Chastain has a habit of peaking at the right time. He can get there to the finale. And, and look, I, the, the reason I even compared Larson's actions to Kyle Busch is because uh, in not only are they really excellent drivers, but uh, I'm a big Kyle Busch fan, and that was a big part of it. So I'm okay in a way with what Kyle Larson's doing. Like if I'm his fan, I'm perfectly fine because I know how it feels. Um, but I just don't think the media, uh, you know, the networks, the national media, those guys, they, they need to start, stop cutting him so much slack. That That's yeah, my that, point. I, that I completely agree with. Um, if, if you contrast Larson versus Hamlin, you're right. Hamlin's getting way more criticism from the press and from the commentators than than Larson has, and you're right. I maybe it is the the stature that that Larson carries out of the car and the way that he approaches. He's much more soft spoken. He's not overly aggressive. He's not putting people down. He's not giving you the sound bites like a Denny Hamlin or a Kyle Busch would, being in your face when they get interviewed after those things. So maybe that's just kind of swaying the the commentator's opinion. Um, I, I agree with you. I think based on the move that he had, it was overly aggressive. He should be getting the criticism for it. You know, it's foreshadowing the conversation we're going to have about Max Verstappen, uh, and he is getting the criticism for it. So <laughs> we shall see. All right, and then all, and then this other uh, incident that sets up another caution was Kyle Larson running out of gas, and poor Kyle Busch. Yeah. Boink. There goes Kyle. So, yeah, that that was, and and you see these two drivers here, I believe. This is it for them. This is when they both pit after this, I believe. And once they came down to the pits, and you saw both of them coming down to the pits, that's when you knew this thing was just completely wide open. Because Larson had just run out of gas. Bush was out of it. And then Hamlin and Truex, they were out of it now. And now it's like, whoa, wait a second. And then you start thinking about all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, that uh, could take place with some of these other long shots. Um, so yeah, that that was some crazy, uh, crazy stuff to see, and surprising to see Larson run out of gas of all drivers of all teams. But hey, it is what it is. And then uh, we we're gonna wrap up uh, with the final run here, and this is this is gonna be uh, Logano. This is the final restart, and there's uh, and and the big deal was Reddick. Now I had Reddick actually because I thought his odds were pretty good on Saturday, uh, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a few bucks on Reddick. So I actually had a little bit more money on Reddick than I had on Logano, 
So when I saw him at this point, knew he had fresher tires. Look how fast he had gotten around. He had a full lap to catch him. I I was I, I, I was kind of glad to see that he was really kicking himself because I was shocked that he could not pass Logano. Yeah, that car was a rocket. Um, kind of came out of nowhere. It passed several cars right at that switch to green, but then I, I don't know if it's the aerodynamics or or what exactly happened. That high line was working for him. Certainly the block uh, cut him down right there that we saw. Um, definitely slowed him down. Um, yeah, I, I thought Reddick was in prime position as well with a lap to go. I thought for sure he was winning it, uh, but Logano, master of the block, at it yet again, ended up taking the air off him, reducing his momentum, and that you know, as a result, Zane Smith even got Reddick at the line, which was also horribly surprising, just given how fast yeah. Reddick came from. Like, look at his his five cars back there, and he comes around the outside past four. He's got one more to go, and then Logano gets the block, and I'm off the last turn, going into the last lap, and that was basically, or off of the last lap, and that was basically it. And by the way, look who was in second place. Who had finished second the week before in New Hampshire? Chase Br- Chase Briscoe. Exactly right. How Somebody crazy was could that have been? Yep. <laughs> and I don't know what happened to him because he ended up. I don't know if he ran out of gas or something because he ended up like way back. Yeah. So, he had to have run out of gas. But yeah, uh, I don't know specifically where Reddick could have had Logano, but there was definitely uh, some point you know right around there. Uh, like right here where he's feels that I'm sure that how do I not how did I not get past him like maybe he should have I don't know what, what he was thinking but again I'm not in the driver's uh, seat but you know as a fan we kind of thought he was going to pass him he thought he should have passed him where exactly you know I'd have to find out if we actually if somebody actually asked, asked him that question where did you go wrong maybe it also affected him a little bit with Zane being on the inside maybe he would have had a shot if Zane wasn't right next to him maybe he could have you know did something else to to get Joey Logano uh you know to kind of screw up but anyway uh that that's how it all unfolded and it was pretty crazy and it lasted a long I mean I don't know what time it was thank goodness they had lights so. <laughs> yeah, like I, I was checking that <laughs> yeah. once it started. Once it started going into overtime, I'm like, does this have lights? Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it was definitely stretching. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, on that last restart, I'm not sure there was anything Reddick could have done other than go down to the inside. You were right; I wasn't thinking about Smith being down there, but you know that um, Logano spotter through that whole last lap was saying 45 is making up ground on the outside. So it, you know, Logano went into that turn knowing that's where he was going to be and ended up doing right. I think uh, Reddick, if he would have turned down more to the inside, probably would have had contact with, with Smith, but um, that probably would have been his only chance to get around. And, and Reddick probably needed just one more lap anyway. Not not just because he would have passed him, but because Logano probably would have ran out of gas. So. Yep. All right. So Reddick's going to have a good chance this week uh, because we're, we're and even though it's not a road course, but it's very close, and that's the street course in Chicago. So... Um, look, we have one race, so we don't have a whole lot to talk about regarding handicapping, history, and all that stuff. So we're just going to, of course, talk road course a little bit, what happened last year. And, and the things to keep in mind from last year is that it was a slick track. And so it, it's it, it's going to be different this year. And, as long, again, as long as it doesn't rain and, and, and all that, and it's, and it's not slick, and, and, and it's be longer because... It was only 75 laps. I don't know. Do you know how many laps they were trying to run? Cause it... uh, last year, they got all 78 in. <clears throat> no, last, um, they had cut it to 75. So I don't know how many was the... Um, I forget when it was, too. There was about 40, lap 45 or 50 around that range. And that's when they said, okay, we're going to cut it to 75 laps. I don't know what the... Do you know what the, the number is? Is it 78? That, that would seem like it, only a little bit. Three laps. It was seven, 78 down to 75. Wow. What only I, three laps. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So not that big of a deal. But anyway, the rain is more important. And that's uh, the slickness of the track. Because we saw some really good drivers get into some uh, bad situations. And look, maybe that would have happened anyway. Because it is a street course. 
but we're going to get into that. The thing you did realize, though, looking at it, Chevy had uh, the top five. So that's a really strong. Ford was six, seven, eight. And so you know which one uh, is, the, is the potential problem here. And that's Toyota, at least for last year. Uh, look, at we've seen already in the last couple of months, we've talked about some manufacturers, including Ford probably the most, about, well, they don't have this or they don't have that, but it's a different year. And every year is different. Every year, what do you think? These guys, you know, the, 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 these smart guys that, that own these cars and that uh, you know, run and manage these cars aren't trying to figure out ways to how do we get better? Of course they are. And that's the reason why sometimes... They can improve from one year to the next. That's why sometimes when you're entering the first of something for that year, it's hard because you're just going back in history, but you don't know. Sometimes um, history will be, uh, the trends will be broken. Like in a way, we saw it Ford winning last week. It, it, but again, as we mentioned before, Toyota was still dominant. And next year, that's why you have to keep notes and make sure that, and we will talk about that when we go over the national race next year. But Toyota, no no drivers in the top eight, only two in the top 17, but they led the laps, 46, 37 of them from Christopher Bell. Chevy had 32 of the laps. Um, yeah, so what do you think about uh, the manufacturer situation, considering there's something to really look at with Toyota, but yet they didn't have result wise, a very good race. Yeah, there's definitely something to look at Toyota. I would not discount them this year, just based on their finishing positions. Because if you look at the stage results in the first stage, um, it was <clears throat> Bell, well, Bell won both stages. Uh, but in the first stage, you had Tyler Reddick finishing second as well in the first stage. So it's not like, um, Toyota and Bell was, I'm sorry, uh, Reddick was third in the uh, second stage too. So it's not like Toyota didn't have speed. It was a wet track. So there were a whole bunch of factors that were out there that were making things a little bit crazy. I mean, Justin Haley started 37th and led 23 laps and finished second. Um, you had Shane Van Gisbergen, who never had been in the car before, came out and, and just walloped everybody. He started third. Um, but again, the whole all the conditions played into that. So I think you really just have to look at road courses in general and who can do well turning left and right. Because like you said, unless it rains again, this is going to race a little bit more like the road courses that we're used to. And the road course guys that we are used to seeing dominate are Christopher Bell, Tyler Reddick, Chris Busher sometimes, Kyle Larson, Chase Elliott, and the only one that's a Ford in there is Chris Busher. So again, I wouldn't worry too much about the manufacturer this week. I would look more toward uh, the driver and their past abilities on road courses in general. Yeah, uh, I, I again, I feel the same way. Especially, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely what I will do is I'll say I'll, I'll probably pick a couple of the Toyotas like Christopher Bell. Uh, but there might be a couple others that I might just shy against. But still, I think you're right. I think pretty much you should just be at least now wait until practice and qualifying. Because if something happens where there's one or two Toyotas in the top 10 in qualifying and practice, well, maybe that's a sign that they might have trouble again for the most part. But for now, I, I think you're, you're right. Um, uh, by the way, four uh, of the top six finishers in the race – started outside the top 15. How about that? They started 18th, 26th, 31st, and 37th. And those four drivers finished in the top six. So how surprising. And that, that has to be a strategy deal, uh, which we see on these types of racetracks. I'm telling you, they also need to water down every single track that we go to after New Hampshire. You know, Chicago was the, the same thing. It was a wet track, so a lot of uh, accidents. So strategy definitely plays a part on the road courses, and you've, you've got much more of a window to be able to play that strategy, to be able to get yourself off strategy, to be able to come out outside of traffic so that you can turn fast laps and then ultimately pass the other cars when they go into the pits. But keep in mind, as these cars were coming out of the pits and as they were going in also, uh, with these wet conditions, they were going into the barriers all the time. Um, so there were a lot of incidents outside of just the strategy moves that just jumbled everything up. 
So again, um, you know, wet tracks just make everything much more unpredictable and much more exciting. And I think that was the biggest factor in the race that we saw last year. So again, I go back to go with the guys that are traditionally very fast on the road courses even if it gets wet, the likelihood of that now that last year was wet, that, wet, that they have the same problems again this year, they're going to get better. They're going to improve. I don't think we're going to see the same kind of chaos again. Yeah, I, I, that's what I'm going to do. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and pop up the odds here as we go over these drivers. So you see the favorites. There's Van Gisbergen as the favorite again. Uh, look, uh, he was in the top five all day. It took him until there was nine laps to go to get the final pass. And there was some drama with Justin Haley. And I was critical of Justin Haley last year. And not because, look, I, I, because this is the way I would, I, and look, again, I'm not a driver, but I think when you got one of these non full time drivers, especially a guy like Van Gisbergen, who is, you know, a, a, if you want to call him a ringer type driver, and you're battling those last laps for the lead. I'm sorry, but if I think this guy is has a good chance of beating me and I feel I have a really good car, he might beat me, I'm getting him out of the way. I, I just am. And you know what? I, I don't think, why should I care? I don't have to race this guy again. You know, who are you coming into my series and trying to take a, way, a win from me and my chance to go to the playoffs. This is my best and probably only chance to make the playoffs, and I'm going to let you beat me? No, I'm, I'm getting you out of the way. Um, but it was you know, a really competitive last several laps with both of them passing each other several times before Gisbergen got away. They had the late caution. I think it was an overtime. They had the late caution but Haley was never able on that last restart to get close enough to him again in order to find out whether or not that would have been his, his time to maybe get him out of the way. But, you know, he had his chance and he, he blew it. And then uh, it was just too late at the end. Yeah, I and I agree with you, but that takes nothing away from Shane Van Gisbergen's oh, of course. performance. No. That was one of the most amazing drives I've ever seen over the, those last nine laps. He had it, and, and he had it better than any other driver in any other car by far. And what was so amazing about it was that weekend was the first time he had ever been in one of those cars. It was just incredible. Everything you know played to his favor with the, the conditions, the the, the chaos of the accidents and all that good kind of stuff and Haley not retaliating. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Haley, you know, Van Gisbergen definitely put his car far enough ahead that it would have been a monumental effort, I think, oh, for yeah. Haley to, to, to take him out, um, would have probably taken both of them out. Uh, so again, all credit to him, but yeah, it, um, just a fantastic drive. And I don't think we're ever gonna see anything like that again, unfortunately. So don't get your hopes up for that this weekend, not to say that it won't be exciting, but I don't think it can be as exciting as it was last year. Yeah, well, that's again, that's the, the the point about this this week is that yeah, he's the favorite, but you know he really shouldn't be the favorite of the race. Totally agree. And part of that has to do with the fact that as we talk about all the time, defending champs or or, or winning last week, it's very hard to do it again. And then you got a driver who just doesn't drive very often in NASCAR, and you're asking him to do it again. It's just, to me, those odds should be doubled. Uh, it's just logical odds is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, hey, he won last year. He's clearly one of the best drivers uh, at this track. Uh, so, yeah, he should be. Yeah, he, he should be, but that's not the odds. are just not – that's just – you talk about how hard it was for him to win last year. If he does it again, I mean, you're really talking about some crazy shit. So yeah, a lightning would have to strike twice. I mean, given the top four choices here, uh, I would go with the bottom two, either Bell or Reddick. To be I honest agree. with you, I I think Van Gisbergen, if he were you know eight, nine, ten, I agree with you. That's probably the right place for him because he's probably going to qualify inside the top ten. He's been running Xfinity. He's won a couple of road courses in Xfinity, but those are completely different cars. And again, he's stepping into a cup car. It's a completely different level of competition. Uh, yes, now he knows this course. He knows the car a little bit more, but he's spending his time in Infinity. If he were here all season, maybe, 
Uh, but yeah, I, I think if you're looking at the odds right now, the ones that are most attractive are Bell and Reddick, especially considering what they did last year with him in the field. They dominated the beginning portions of the race. Yep. Uh, they both wrecked later in the day. Uh, Bell led most of the laps, 37, as I mentioned before, and uh, almost half of the laps, actually. Uh, he started fourth. And by the way, second at Coda, ninth at Sonoma this year. Reddick, uh, meanwhile, fifth at Coda, eighth at Sonoma. Uh, and he did lead the most laps at Sonoma this year. And he was fourth, by the way, when he spun out late in the race last year. And he started second. So they both started in the, in the top two rows. And I can't imagine anything really crazier uh, on Sunday. This should probably be start up there as well. Uh, by the way, Reddick last year had one Coda before he raced here. Uh, so he had some momentum. And we just and that's just the way he is anyway. We know how good he is on the road courses. Uh, and also, Reddick is kind of dialed in now. He's had a nice little run in his last six races. Five of them are in the top ten. Three of them are in the top five, uh, including what happened last uh, on Sunday when he finished third. So, yeah, and he's getting six to one. So that's why mm-hmm. I agree with you with the two of them. Matter of fact, if I had to pick one, I'd pick Reddick. I would agree. Yep. And he's going to be hungry after last week, too. Yep. It's close. All right. And now we have – see, Elliot is in a position where uh, I, I think it's exactly where he should be at 8-1. to one. He was third last year. Uh, and, and I think the thing important to note is he was one of them that started outside. He started 26th and still ended up third. And remember, last year wasn't a great year for Elliot either. So um, I'm a little bit concerned with how he's run just recently. I wonder whether he's going to go through a little lull. Um because I've kind of we've talked about him as being an interesting play the last few weeks because his odds were good even last week I think it was eighteen to one on race day, but he's not con- he's not coming through. So I, I but it is a different course, different setup. He's driving a Chevy, of course. He was fourth at Sonoma, uh, which is his best finish this year on, on the road, uh, and the odds are pretty good for Chase Elliott. Um, but I I don't know. I just have this feeling that this is just not a good time to take him. I don't know why, just don't, but I, I if anybody wants to take him, go for it. Um, the other guys, I, I, I'd i probably take a look at AJ at 12-1 to 1 because AJ's getting good odds. I know he didn't wasn't a factor last year. That's a concern, but he was sixth at both road course races this year. We know how good he is, and, 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 he, and this is just one of those opportunities for AJ that at 12 to 1, I, I, I could be interested in him because I just I can't take Truex right now. There's just in a bad go of it. And Byron is also just not really, uh, things aren't really happening for him lately. So out of this group, I'd probably look at Elliot and AJ, and I might take AJ as, as the top one. Yeah, I completely agree with you. The reason not to take Elliot right now is, again, the new car. <clears throat> on the road course he used to be great on the road courses <clears throat> but that was the old car uh with point. the new car has hasn't been very good on the road courses maybe getting a little bit better with that fours place at sonoma but like you said he's got two 18th 18th place finishes in the last two wait weeks and that's not a great run of momentum aj allmendinger he knows these cars he knows these tracks he knows these competitors um he um stumbled a little bit i'll say last year I, I can't remember exactly what happened to him he qualified inside the top 10 qualified 10th but ended up finishing 17th some people might be thinking that, that they w- might choose byron over elliot uh, but i will tell you that byron in this race last year only qualified 22nd and worked his way up to 13th didn't finish inside the stage points if i remember correctly so without a doubt given different conditions nice conditions <clears throat> Only a 30% chance of thunderstorms, I think, on Sunday for the race in Chicago, which means likely not going to happen. Certainly on this page, go with A.J. Allmendinger. Yeah, uh, Truex, no top fives in his last seven on the year. Uh, Tenth at Coda, 27th at Sonoma. Uh, Byron did win Coda, not so good at Sonoma, uh, but one top ten in his last five. That was the runner-up at Iowa. So I don't really like the way some of these drivers are going um, so that's why I kind of tend to go down to who's got the best odds and who's the most desperate, who knows this is one of his races to win, and that's AJ. Uh, but I also, Elliot is also somebody that I would definitely keep an eye on, especially 
if he winds up qualifying well, considering he did not qualify well last year, as I mentioned, and still finished in third. So, El- the problem is uh, you're 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 rolling the dice because if Elliott qualifies in the top five or six, I think that's fine. If he's like on the pole, you're screwed because you're going to lose probably three points on odds, and then I just would probably I wouldn't touch him at five to one or something like that. Okay, now we go to some of these long shots, and. These are some good ones. These are these are my best, actually. I like all these guys. Uh, I, I, there's one more that I like better, but McDowell I like, Busher uh, definitely, Chastain because look at those odds. I mean Chastain. I know he didn't do anything at this race last year, but I mean he's been okay overall, especially this year. Seventh at Coda, fifth at Sonoma, and you're getting twenty-eight to one, and he's desperate for a win. Uh, McDowell, we just talked about it last week, about whether or not he'd get a win. As a matter of fact, one of our uh, viewers uh, uh, answered my question last week about whether or not McDowell or Gilliland would get a win this year. And uh, we had a couple who responded. Uh, Wayne, Wayne responded, McDowell should get a win this year. Gilliland will not, but what do I know? I let a girl beat me a couple of weeks ago. So... Uh, of course, he's the one that also has talked about yes, because you had talked about Barb, and I was going to say, and Wayne good old said, Barb. "Yeah, <laughs> yes, I did beat Barb, but didn't win the week. <laughs> this is going to be my comeback week. Apparently, it wasn't, but I don't know. Uh, with the great knowledge you have given me, thanks for another great show. Uh, so yeah, uh, Wayne's got it. Uh, uh, I hope Barb's good looking. That's all I can say. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Mark Simmons, great video as always, wasn't it? Bell, who was second to last going back-to-back in 2022. I think because we talked about how hard it is to go back-to-back. I think he does it this week. And, hey, he was right there for a while uh, after a couple stages. I also think McDowell wins one of the street road courses, either Chicago or Watkins Glen. He's been sneakily contending but blundering, but I think he pulls it off. So, yeah. So, uh, I, I agree with McDowell. I think this might be a good spot for him. And uh, and, a goal, and again, Bush has also looked pretty good on the road courses this year. Yeah, my two choices on this screen are, are Michael McDowell, first and foremost, without question. He's one of the few guys last year, given all the um, trouble as well as the conditions, that was able to start inside the top 10 and finish inside the top 10 as well. He qualified sixth and finished seventh. Like you said, he had a bunch of other people that came up from very far behind through strategy and avoiding uh, the crashes and all that good kind of stuff. But McDowell was consistent throughout, just like Van Gisbergen and Larson and Logano. Gibbs was another one who was pretty consistent, qualified 12th, finished ninth last year. Chris Busher would be my second choice, though, but he would only be my second choice if he qualifies better than 15th. So last year he qualified 15th and worked his way inside the top 10. He ended up finishing 10th. If he qualifies inside the top 10, I think Busher is a must take because that signals to me that he's going to be competitive throughout the entire race, if not even move forward. So I think, um, you know, his odds probably aren't going to get that much better unless he ends up qualifying on pole or sitting on the front row. So you're probably okay uh, waiting a little bit. You might lose a little bit of ground. But I think McDowell's a clear choice on this one. Wait to see where Chris Busher qualifies. If he's inside the top 10, go ahead and take him then. Yeah, don't forget McDowell, seventh last year, second at Sonoma. So he's coming off that second place finish. Busher was third at Sonoma. Led 32 laps. That's the best he's ever done on a road course. So that's where he's coming in. And by the way, he has three top fives in his last four races. So as you can see, you know, opposite of what some of these shorter odds drivers are going through. That's why this is a week because it's a street course too. It's not even a road course. It's a street course. I just think this is a week to go with the long shots. And that's why I'm going to try to do that. Uh, with some of these uh, drivers again, McDowell, Busher, and Chastain. Uh, Chastain, by the way, I think he has one win. That was uh, Coda. Coda, uh, correct. Yeah. Yep. So he, he does uh, he does know how to drive on these road course type setups. So twenty eight to one, it's a nice bargain. Speaking of bargains, uh, two right here: Kyle Busch, Ryan Blaney. Blaney is so hot right now that even though he's not finishing races 
you know you're looking at the charts and you're seeing where they finishing it's it's misleading because again we talked about the decision last week he doesn't make that decision with all the craziness that happened in that race he might have won the race if they just would have stuck with well maybe there'll be a bunch of, maybe there'll be five cautions at the end of the race uh yeah, but hey it is what it is true. <laughs> <laughs> Very so, true. yeah uh kyle i really like this week i get the feeling that two reasons one it was he did one of their best weeks last week in a long time two don't forget what he did last year kyle bush last year in this race had that early uh screw up where he ended into the he slammed into the tires that was on lap three i believe he was running 16th at the time so he slams into the tire lap three running 16 so he's in big trouble early he finishes the race fifth so that is a big accomplishment there so that's a great sign that he's able to finish fifth um and he's had a couple decent runs on the road courses this year, ninth and 12th. That's okay, considering how bad he's been this year. That's probably pretty good. Uh, and again, I just think it's the timing. He's coming off a really confident week for the whole team that maybe... And look, he's not 10-1 to 1 or 15-1. to 1. If, if that's the case, I'm not jumping out of my chair like I am right now. He's 30-1. to 1. So because he's 30-1... to 1, and because Blaney's red hot at 35 to 1, they're just must plays for me. Yeah, I think Kyle Bush certainly for me is a must play at 30 to 1 um, for all the reasons that you said. Even if you don't count him going into the tire barrier, he qualified 18th and finished fifth. That alone would have been enough to, to say he's somebody to choose this week. I don't know why he's 30 to 1, probably the most recent results, in fact, that didn't get to finish last week. But when you throw in the fact that he was nose first into that tire barrier as well, uh, that speaks even more volumes. Blaney definitely on a hot streak. You, you don't get a driver on a hot streak at 35 to 1 defending champion every week, so probably worth taking. He has one on a road course before. Uh, it was a Charlotte Roval. So he's not bad. He knows how to get to the finish line at these tracks as well. Uh, and then Denny Hamlin again, 35 to one. He was out, he was your pole sitter last year. Uh, didn't make anything out of it. Ended up uh, coming home 11th that day. Um, but still, it's a really good bunch of drivers here. Daniel Suarez won one on road course as well. So yeah, you, you got three of them or four of them here. All road course winners. All out, greater than 25 to one. Um, some of them on, on really good streaks. I think anyone from this bunch would be a good pick. But Kyle Busch certainly stands out among the rest just based on this track and what he did last year. Yeah, again, the, you know, the, the difference with Hamlin is is Hamlin is not 5-1 to one like some of those other drivers um, where I'd be going, oh, there's no way. Look at the way he's been going lately. He hasn't had a top 10 in his last uh, four races, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some, and it's, again, it's just bad luck, but that's what, you know, good drivers go bad luck streaks, and that's what's going on right now. Um, and he hasn't looked good on the road courses this year either. Um, but then again, as you said, he was on the pole last year, and he's 35 to 1. So that is a big number for even Denny Hamlin, and he, he may not be a bad uh, little look as well. Uh, and then the rest of them, out of all the other long shots, Logano certainly ain't winning back to back. Sindrick, I have a hard time. Uh, that's why I didn't really say much about Suarez. I have a hard time to see Suarez and Sindrick winning a second race at this point. Um, Briscoe, I just don't see anything with his history on road courses. Otherwise, I mean, again, as I said before, I mean, he almost finished second in back to back races. Speaking of second, there's Zane Smith. Justin Haley, to me, is a must play. I mean, he's 100 to 1, and he almost won the race last year. Now, the biggest difference, though, and, and maybe this is the reason why he's still 100-1, to 1, is he was driving a Chevy last year. So now he's driving a Ford. It could mean everything or it could mean nothing. Now, again, I don't know if that's the reason. You tell me. Do you think Justin Haley, if he was still driving a Chevy, would still be 100-1? to 1? Because I guess maybe he would. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, I think he would be. Um I'm not sure why he's 100 to 1 at this track particular 
lately considering what what he did last year um but i mean prior to all the weirdness he, he wasn't showing anything he only qualified 37th you know 100 to 1 is probably where he's at most weeks if not lower uh he did lead 23 laps it was unique conditions uh, i agree i think uh, if you can get the the prior runner up at 100 to 1 you probably should do it I yeah don't, i don't put a whole lot of stock in in the type of car that he's driving this um, year by the way uh you know this is why maybe you look at the fact that he has no positive history whatsoever on road courses and yet almost won the race last year yep so that's why and by the way he led 23 laps so it wasn't like you know he was uh just kind of up there for a little bit or got lucky he started 37th He's one of those drivers I mentioned at the top. 37th. That's another reason. Just imagine if he qualifies. Now, good. I, I, he was one of those five or six drivers that had, they, you know, they caught him with something, unapproved, whatever. And that's why Haley and a bunch of other drivers ended up starting, like, in the 30s. Um, we'll see what happens this, this go around. Uh, I'm sure it has to do with the fact that it's a street race and, and they're trying to, you know, monkey around with shit. But... Um, yeah, but don't forget, you know, Austin Sindrick was another one that started back there, ended up finishing sixth. He's got a great record in road course racing. Before he was even in the series full time, when he was doing the road courses part time, he would come out and he would lead laps and he would end up having some you know weird issue. It wouldn't surprise me to see Austin Sindrick end up winning a race. But you're right. Uh, I had forgotten that Haley actually started at the rear because of uh, unapproved adjustments. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that gives even more credence to making sure you, you jump on the 101, 100 to 1 odds for him this week, for sure. Yeah, matter of fact, you know what? The difference between Suarez and uh, Sindrick is pretty apparent to me, and that's the odds. Yeah. I mean, if I'm just looking at Sindrick, I'm going like, again, yeah, do I think he's going to win two races? No, but we know he can drive on road courses just like Suarez can, but I'm getting 50 to 1. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to 28 to 1. So, yeah, again, just like Hamlin, uh, they're not going to be my top bet, but I'd be silly if I have, you know, enough money in my account just not just to put a 1 next to a couple of these drivers, you know, and, and uh, you know, make your money back, if anything else. Uh, by the way, Hale, just uh, the other thing with Haley, before we wrap this up here, in his first 11 races this year, his average finish was 26.9. In his last eight, it's 18.2. So Haley is picking it up at this point in time. We know he's really good uh, on uh, the super speedways, but it'll be interesting to see what happens here on the street course that he was at his best, maybe ever. Um, and I think the 100 to 1 is, uh, is a gift. So, okay picks oh by the way uh john hunter nemechek a 400 to one to finish second in the xfinity series last year and austin dillon had a good run last year but until something happened to him late but austin dillon has just been speaking of kyle bush being bad austin dillon has just been a nightmare this year so all right has had a rough go of it for sure picks so what are you gonna go with cj uh with uh uh, you're going to go with Reddick as, as your top pick? I'll go with Reddick as my top pick. Yes, why not? Okay. Yeah, I'm. I. I that's that's the way I'm going to go as well. Uh, other picks, uh, what do you like? I like McDowell okay. for the mid-range. And then at the bottom end, uh, I will throw in Austin Sindrick. Oh, okay. And I'm def I'm gonna go Reddick. Uh, I'll I'll go Busher then, um, and 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 I guess I'll go. Well, I'm definitely taking Kyle, uh, Kyle Bush. Um, so if we if we're just limiting it to three, it'll be we'll take we'll both take Reddick. You'll take McDowell in the in the middle. I'll take Busher in the middle. You'll go with Cindric as a long shot. I'll take Kyle, as a long shot. Sounds good. All right. What's up next week? Uh, next week is Pocono. Oh, Pocono. Your tricky triangle, one of your favorites. 
Well, I'm I'm glad that we only have it once a year now. So, <laughs> you know, which is it's only once a year. I've actually, you know, this has been going on now for what a couple of years, three years, two years. Yeah, three years, three years now. I think it's been just a single single race. They used to be so close together too. That yeah. in Michigan it seemed like there were only a couple of weeks in between those two races. Well, that's the other thing too is that it, because it's only been one race the last couple of years. I, 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 it's already kind of been a good thing because I'm kind of okay. It's Pocono. All right, let's watch Pocono. I've only seen it twice in the last two years, <laughs> as opposed to four times in the last right. two years. Right. You know. So yes. okay. Like, you know, maybe it, yeah. It's, again, it's still not uh, a preferable because it's one of those racetracks too that you just hardly ever can conceive of it really working out like for a good finish. Yeah, the way the track yeah, is laid it, out, it's you know. all about um, it's all about handling through that first turn. That first turn is pretty much the only spot that you can get uh, a run on anybody or make passes. The, it's tough to go side by side through turn two in the tunnel turn. There's a bump and it's pretty tight and, and narrow there. And then the last long sweeping turn is all about arrows, so it makes it very challenging to pass off of there too. So really. Out of the three corners, there's really, really only one where you can get a really good shot at passing somebody, which again sets up not close finishes. You end up having um, somebody that just has a better car, like Hamlin had last week, until all the cautions started coming, and yeah, yeah. you know looks to looks set to drive away to win. And we'll have a good time going over because again we talk about strategy. There's a lot of strategy involved in Pocono. All right. Well, that's next week. So once again, if you are if you're interested in what we have to say regarding F1, because we have a lot to go over, we're going to go over uh, the battle there with Norris and Verstappen. We're going to get their comments. We're going to get the highlights. We're going to get the preview for the uh, British Grand Prix. So that's coming up on our F1 coverage. So check us out there for NASCAR fans. Uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>